Hello, everybody. How's it going? <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> Surprise. Um, welcome to Building Applications with Generative AI and, and Live Data. Uh, my name is Memo Doring. Hello, hello, my name's Mike Chambers, developer advocate for Amazon Web Services. I think we had an alternative name for this as well. Yes. Which was, it seemed like a good idea at the time. And um, maybe you'll see why. Yeah, and, and then we <laughs> built it, and it was maybe less of a good idea. But um, as you can see, we've got a little, little demo up here for you all. But if you, if you go to the expo, or if you've been at the expo, uh, you could have played with this as well. Um, and we wanted to go a little bit more into detail, because it's a little bit of a black box. So. That's the inspiration behind this, something that was actually running and that people could, could play with. Um, so we could go one, a couple steps beyond a, a proof of concept. So sure. Oh, straight into the demo. Absolutely. OK, so we have some code to show you running, um, and I have some buttons to press. So if I just press this button here, hopefully you'll see my, um, I've got VS Code. I'm just going to press Run on this. We're not stepping through the code. You don't, I don't want to do that to you. Um, so if I press play here, hopefully everything will work for us. If you were in earlier, you might have seen some bits and pieces working. Um, who was in earlier and saw some bits and pieces working? Uh, are they holding up the hands memo? <laughs> <laughs> you were here, right? And it worked? Yep. OK. All right. Um, can you talk for just a second? Because for some reason, that's not working. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the demo and what we're, we're trying to do. So what we have here is just a little armature with a regular webcam and a regular wooden toy. Uh, and what we wanted to do is take live data in the form of images and use generative AI to generate an output. Um, and what we also wanted to do is what's usually referred to chaining, combining multiple uh, large language models or uh, foundation models to have a more complex output. Um, the way it works is that we take a picture of, the, of a character. Um, if you go down to the expo, you'll find multiple characters. We only stole one for our session, so we only have the blue elephant. But you could pick different ones, um, and you're, you're good? Yeah, well, I hope so. So what we're looking at here is the app. So this is the app that I was just trying to press play on. Um, and like Memo was saying, yes. Yeah, so we've got um, a number of things. We've got this camera hooked up. And we've also got a big button, because we're trying to make an interactive demo, something which is hands-on, which can um, excite people without having to bring them to a keyboard to have to type some stuff. So with this setup here, if I just press the button, um, it works. Of course it works. Um, and now we can see a camera feed of elephant um, sat underneath here. So what happens, and how far did you get through the explanation with what happens? So I, uh, I, I'll talk about the, 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 the experience of what happens here. So when I press the button, um, a picture of the uh, character, in this case, blue elephant, gets taken. It gets looked at by Amazon recognition. It then speeds through. So what you're seeing here is happening in real time. Um, and it is now inside of Amazon Bedrock, the, the, the idea that we're looking at an elephant and that we're at reInvent. 2023. And so Amazon Bedrock, using um, the Claude V2 model, is in the back end currently constructing a story for us, hopefully about Blue Elephant, um, or not, as the case may be. So we have this issue here where um, we've trained a model specifically for the show floor, because the lighting on the show floor is a particular way. Um, and so it's, it's, it's fantastic. Definitely not a blue elephant. That's all the good stuff. So <laughs> you, might, you might recognize that <laughs> trademark character up there. Um, it so, is not a blue, blue so elephant. I can talk to why that's happened. So basically, this lighting setup and what we have here is not working with our custom-trained uh, custom recognition model. And so it didn't detect, unfortunately, blue elephant. And so what it's done is Claude has decided that because um, we've not got um, a character there, um, it's going to hallucinate for us a character instead. So these are all the kinds of challenges that we've had to face, and hence it felt like a good idea at the time. And and so it constructs a story for us, um, and um, you're going to try doing it again. Why not? I'm, I'm a sucker for pain. Yeah. So the part of the idea was we wanted a single button press to be the interaction for like something that customers could play with, no typing, no prior knowledge required. And then for people that were more interested and, and wanted to know more about this, we would have this session. But if you were just, what is this LLM thing? What's 
show me a practical application of it, we could do it. Um, on top of the data that's coming from the camera, we're also taking a feed of headlines from reInvent, so everything should be reInvent or AWS themed. Um, yeah. So you'll see here this one. It's got an AWS mascot this yeah. time, I think. You can scroll up there. And so see it, it. it didn't do a trademark character, uh, yeah. thankfully. Um, <laughs> there now go. there's an AWS mascot that appears to be a blue iguana of some You recognize sort. that, oh, There right? we go, Axolotl. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is, like Mike said, this is to be expected because we have a model that was trained. We, and we'll, we'll go into detail in a little yeah. bit of how we did it, but it's trained for the show floor. This is completely different lighting, a different surface. Um, everything is, is different, so it's, it's having a harder time finding the blue elephant. And then for us, the, we look at this and we think blue elephant, but uh, a model would think toy, uh, kid, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not a real blue elephant, right? So if we had a, a, a real blue elephant, A, um, it'd be pretty fear-inducing, and B, uh, the model would behave better um, when we were trying to take a picture of it. Yes. So I put us back to slides. I'm feeling slides might be a bit more deterministic yes. than the example, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, slide, uh, generation is definitely not deterministic. We also have live polling for, for all of you. So if you're interested, you can pull out your phone, use that QR code to do polling. As results come in, um, we'll get a, a signal from the back and they'll, they'll let us know and we'll, we'll start discussing them a little bit. Uh, they're all multiple, multiple answer, um, no, multiple choice, sorry, no wrong answers. Um, we just want to gauge your opinion on a few different things so we can talk a little bit more about it. Absolutely. So take this. If you've, everybody's got it, we can switch the screen. We've got the screen there. I can see the answers. Are you using generative AI on your workloads or workflow today? No. Yeah, so about a third of you are using um, gen, generative AI for your workloads today. Um, I don't know why I'm looking up there if I got it down yeah. here. <laughs> but, um, and it's dropping, so it's even, even less than a third. I think that's to be expected. It's a new technology. And what we wanted to talk about is a little about the architecture that we use, the technology that we use in an AWS context for how we built this. I don't think anyone is about to become a millionaire off of stories made from, for a blue elephant made out of wood, Promise. but uh, I'm, I've been wrong before. It won't be the first time. Yeah. So that's not so, uh, the, the, the results from that poll are something which I think I've seen throughout reInvent as well. So um, obviously a big focus of reInvent this year, if you haven't noticed, has been generative AI. And I think a lot of us have used the tools and played around with chatbots and experienced the kinds of things that large language models can do. And now we're in a mode of, well, how can we actually practically apply this into an application stack, into a business context? And so whilst we're talking about toys, there's a lot of that in the undercurrent of what we're talking about today. Yeah, and Mike and I are silly, so we wanted to do something funny, but um, we did want to go into detail on how we built this, and, and there's a method to the madness. So you'll think, well, this, uh, this little armature is a bit of overkill, but something that we wanted to make sure is there's people walking through the expo hall at all times. We didn't want to capture someone's face uh, by mistake or anything like that. We didn't want to share or store any sensitive data um, so we, we mounted it in a way where it was, you'd have to pick it up and point it at your face. And actually, the one that's at the expo floor has like a little board at the bottom. So even if you try to point it at your face, you couldn't do that. Um, but there were also architecture, architectural decisions that we made based on that. So instead of saying, so my, my original idea was, we'll take a picture, we'll put it in an S3 bucket, that'll trigger an event, and off we go to the races. But that means I'm storing images, and if someone somehow manages to throw their driver's license on there, now I have sensitive data. So Mike came up with a brilliant idea of having a little light client, and what the client does is it makes an API call to recognition, or through API gateway into recognition, but we're passing the image as a byte encoded string. So we're never storing the image, and we don't log the, that byte encoded string anywhere. Um, through the process. So we don't have a cloud trail or it's not in cloud logs or anything like that. So the image doesn't necessarily exist anywhere in the system. Then we use recognition and we get a JSON object back saying um, blue elephant when, when it works properly. Um, and then what we do is we're orchestrating everything using 
uh, step functions. So instead of using a, a framework or anything like that, we're doing everything inside our, our AWS account using AWS services to, to manage the whole thing. We're using step functions. It's calling Lambda functions um, to invoke Amazon Bedrock, and that's where multiple LLMs come in. As, as Mike mentioned, all the text generation, all the story generation, the descriptions for the images are being handled by Claude V2, and all the image generation is being handled by St uh, Stability Diffusion SDXL 0.8, 0.9. Um, once the images are generated, we put them in S3 buckets, we have a Lambda function to help us stitch everything together. What you are seeing uh, in the presentation was an actual web page that was being rendered with the images, and that's why we could control it slides it, or it refreshes itself, um, and we can present it on uh, a different monitor. All of this is uh, also controlled by the state machine, and using Lambda functions, we can return back. So we, all, we, we couldn't figure out how to do it up here, but we also have an output window where we can see all the debug stages. We say, okay, you're at this point, this is the ARN for the, for the function that got called, we generate the text, et cetera, et cetera. So we can see everything and we, can, we, can, um, we have pretty good observability into the system as it's, as it's flowing through it. That's right. So this is a technical setup that we have on the show floor. So if you want to go and take a look, you can play around with more than just Blue Elephant. We've also got all the other animals too. Um, and as Memo was saying before, the, the model there is trained. Um, it's a recognition custom uh, custom labels model that's been trained specifically on the show floor. It actually was, I created this um, when I was, uh, I live in Australia and that's not important particularly, but I wasn't here. I created it at home and trained the model up and it was working fine. When we got to the show floor, we also had the same problem. It was actually really easy to be able to retrain a custom model with recognition custom labels just overnight and just come and bring it in and get the activation working. It's been working flawlessly all week apart from in this room. So I'm sorry about that. And I, I think the, the, the way you train the custom labels is, is also interesting. Cause mm. I didn't work on that piece. And then we were at, in the show floor on Sunday night um, before it opened. And we were doing some testing. And it broke. And Mike was like, oh, I need to, to test to get more data to train a new model. And I was like, how hard is like, Are we going to be clicking uh, through a bunch of pictures with our iPhones or uh, with our phones or whatever? And uh, you came up with a pretty I felt uh, innovative solution. So using the same camera, we <laughs> just took video and we moved the animals around in the, we were in the live space and then Mike chopped off that video. And the fact that it was a little grainy and sometimes it was out of focus was actually good for us because customers are gonna come up and they're, they're not necessarily gonna put the elephant dead smack in the middle. Um, it might be even a little bit out of frame. They might put a couple things around. We had a glass here or, or something like that. Um, and then the model was a little bit more. Shadows, shadows are a thing as well. So people standing close to it with shadows. Yeah, and I think for, for this one, probably what is the biggest change is the, the bottom or like the, totally different, yeah. yeah, it's black instead of white. Uh, and then the lights are coming that way. So it the lighting is actually much better in here. Yes. We should have the whole thing in here all week. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, working with live, live data, Yes. I think it's, it's... Okay. So this is where we could talk a little bit more about the practicalities of, um, of working with large language models and live data. So we'll, we'll pa 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 pause la Blue Elephant there for a moment. What we're doing here really is using retrieval augmented generation. And that might be a stretch for some of you. I can see some smiles in the audience. But one of the real key things and one of the main messages that I wanted to bring to reInvent this year is that retrieval augmented generation is super, super powerful. It's super useful. And it's really the, um, the forefront of where we're currently adopting large language models in a business context, sort of outside of research. Um, and it helps us to be able to get more accurate results with what is very much an undeterministic thing of a large language model. So the way that we work with um, large language models, and you might be familiar, is that we prompt them. So we, we, we write some text, so prompt, fancy word of way of saying text, and we send that into the large language model. The large language model then will take that prompt and will create a response for us, or a completion, and it does that by taking the prompt and running it through the large language model, uh, getting a next token or a next word, and then adding that on and then running through and through and through. All of this amazing technology we're working with is predicated on the, the idea 
of just generating the next word. That's fantastic. We've seen um, and we acknowledge and we work with hallucinations with these things. Sometimes, as we've seen today, when it's not given input or um, when it's allowed to be too creative, it can hallucinate and come out with something which is not necessarily what we wanted. And there's a number of different methods that we can put in place to try and mitigate this. And earlier on this year, maybe late last year, we would be looking at training our own models, doing fine tuning, getting a massive data set and pushing it all in. And then a lot of us sort of took a step back and, and said, well, how about if we just put the data inside of the prompt? And this is in-context learning. So taking data that we have that wasn't necessarily available to the large language model at the point of training and putting it in the prompt, so then the large language model can see it at the time of inference, at the time that we're making the generation. And the data that goes in there becomes more prominent and more at the front of the mind, and I'm anthropomorphizing large language models, please bear with me. It's further in the front of its context, context window, um, the data is there. And you, you used a few technical terms there, so let me just uh, go over them. So for those that didn't, aren't math wizards like Mike, uh, something that's deterministic is you're always going to get the same result with the same input. So anytime you ask me if I want coffee, the answer is going to be yes, no matter <laughs> the time of the day. That's deterministic. Um, if you ask me if I want pizza, that might change if I just ate or if I'm about to go to bed, et cetera, et cetera. That's not deterministic. So the, the lar large language models in general are non-deterministic. You can make them closer to deterministic or, or deterministic depending on the model by how you configure them. But that's, that's something that's different when you're working with an LLM from a certain API. So if I make a call to an API and I ask it, how do I get from lat longitude X and Y to lat longitude A and B, it most likely will always give me the same route. But if you start thinking about something that is context aware, like traffic, it might give me different routes, and that's non-deterministic. So it's giving you different outputs depending on the context. With, with LLMs, with, with foundation models, that is, that is very common. And then context is what we call the ability of a foundation model uh, to see how much data it can capture. And that is going to also vary model by model and the types of data that you can share. Some of them, uh, if you were uh, at the keynote, um, models from Anthropic, you can give it a pretty large book as part of the context, and it'll take it all into account with your prompt. So, Absolutely. So, so the amount of data that you can take from your business system or from wherever can actually be quite sizable. Often with prompts, especially when we start to play with large language models, we're typing in a sentence or two and saying, will it do this thing? You can actually put in quite a large amount of data. And, and to the point of non-deterministic, we'll look at that a little bit in the demo as well. Someone once said to me, it feels like large language models have got a random number generator in them. They do. That's what they have. They have this random number generator to help make them feel more creative, more like humans. And sometimes we need to kind of turn that down and dial that back. In terms of then where you can get the data from, um, well, it's wherever you've got that data. And with retrieval augmented generation, uh, re retrieval augmented generation um, quite often you'll hear conversations, probably especially this week, by people who are really excited about this technology, including me, that you can get it from vector databases. Um, and you ca absolutely can, but a lot of us don't have vector databases currently. So it's important to remember that we can also get data from other systems. You can get it from a SQL database. You can get it from an API that you might have connected to goodness knows anything. You can get it from a CSV file. You can get it from a piece of Python code that we put together for a demo like this. It's all similar kinds of stuff. If you can search a system, get some data back, put it into your prompt, that's really what retrieval augmented generation is all about. Yeah, you can even get it from a picture of a blue elephant, which is the, the route we chose to take. Yeah. Um, so this is a, a quick screenshot of the model working with the custom labels. So we, we knew what our, the toys that we had were, so that's what we trained it on. And it was very successful at finding those with, in, within a certain parameters, uh, which were the, the show floor. That's right. We optimized for where we believed the most customers would interact with it. And we weren't too uh, afraid to fail here in front of all, all of our closest 300 friends um, when we were talking about this. 
So this is um, Amazon recognition. It's spelled with a K if you're looking for it. And it's a pre, uh, well, it's, it's a image or a recognition object detection service. So it, actually out of the box, there is pre-trained models to be able to make recognition, to be able to make detections on a number of different things. So you can take um, an image, just a standard image of just uh, a crowd of people or a city street or whatever. Um, and if you look in the console, there are actually some demos in the console. So it's, it's uh, actually very interactive. And it will recognize common, um, common objects. So people and cars and um, trains and I don't know. Sunglasses, balls, that, that kind of thing. Exactly. But if you want more, more specificity or if you're working with something like this where it's a stylized elephant, that's where we had to train our own model. Um, and this is more traditional machine learning, mm -hmm. not necessarily on the generative AI side. But if you want to abstract it all out, we just send an image up, and we get a JSON object back that says, there's an elephant here, or there's the AWS mascot, whatever that uh, monster was in what you saw generated. Yeah. And, and recognition, recognition Custom Labels has the user interface to be able to generate your data set. So if you upload images, and as Memo said, I took a video on the show floor where we moved the elephant in the room. We hadn't said that before. We moved the, uh, all the um, different characters around, and then we took screenshots from those, and I was able to create bounding boxes around them and create the data set like we've got there. Yeah. Cool. We have another question to ask. One more poll. What live data could you unlock with generative AI? And, and I hope that you can now sort of see this in a frame, um, which is a little different maybe to some of the other presentations we've got. Um, you can connect in to any data source you've got. As long as you can get some kind of textual output to it, you can use it with in-context learning, which becomes retrieval augmented generation. Your live data can now be used. And, and something that I, um, the more we worked on this and the more that I've done with Gen AI, uh, I think it's important to, for all of us is there's a whole new vocabulary that comes with, with these technologies, but it doesn't mean that they're necessarily harder than what we were doing before or they're completely separated. There's, there's ways to just uh, abstract those in. So you'll, see, you'll hear things like zero shot or um, one shot, et cetera, but they're just, they're just strategies around prompting, for example, um, that... that are the state of the art today, but we didn't even know about those maybe 12 months ago. The really exciting thing right now is that lots of us are in a very much an experimental mode. So let's, let's just continue to push forward and what we, data we can put in there. So customer database, um, the biggest one we have here is analytics and reporting which is super interesting. So that's interesting because, of course, a lot of the people who are making analytics and reporting services are using a lot of these services to augment what they have, um, including things like QuickSight. So putting your data into QuickSight using generative AI as part of the product. But of course, we can also build these solutions ourselves yep. as well. Awesome. And the wiki was a, was, a, was a good one. All right. You're going to press this button? I'll press this button. Um, so we thought we'd just do a quick uh, demonstration of some of the different components of what we're doing. Um, oh, the demo is not yet. Yep. It feels like we've practiced this, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we, a big component of what we did is around text. And a lot of what you'll see around foundation models is around text generation. Or um, So we, we wanted to split out the different pieces uh, as we use them. So we're using, um, can I borrow the clicker? Yeah. Uh, we're using a large language model from our partner Anthropic through a service that's called Bedrock. Uh, and in case you're not familiar with Bedrock, what it allows you to do is to make API calls um, into a large language model. So you don't have to stand up your own infrastructure. You don't have to go um, negotiate a deal with a vendor for a LLM. You can, use, you can use it through an API. It's within your AWS console. Uh, we're using Claude V2, um, and it's a text generation LLM. Um, the, the people at Anthropic use something that's called constitutional AI. So they've trained or they've included um, big data sets around um, the different alignment uh, that they want from the, from the model as they're training it. So it uh, returns results that are positive and uh, are ethical in, in, in the way they approach it. And then uh, 100 thousand tokens is the context window for, and I think that's outdated now because like the newer versions of Claude, I think 2.1 has 200K tokens. 
as an oversimplification, you can think of a token as a word. Uh, a really large word like architectural might actually be three tokens, but um, if you want to just kind of ballpark it, a, a token. So you can pass this model 100K tokens, your prompt included, and say, give me a response. So it could be a whole sales report or something like that and say, hey, give me the, the data from this report specifically in, um, in a different format or uh, extract a certain piece of data from it. And you're just working with text and prompts. What you get back or what actually gets generated looks like this. It's just a, a, a regular JSON object. Where well, you say, the request, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so this is the, the prompt. And you, there's a few parameters there that you'll notice and you'll hear them around the industry, um, the temperature, top K, top P, and a stop sequence. Temperature is literally how spicy you want your answer. So the higher the temperature, the spicier it's gonna get. And by spicier, it means that it's gonna be less strict around what is the most probable next token. So if it, the temperature is low and I say, uh, the brown fox jumps over, it'll most likely go the lazy dog. But if I turn up the temperature, it, I could say the brown fox jumps over and it could go the, the jet airplane. Yeah, the jet airplane or the circus on the moon, right? Like it just, it gets very creative. And you can play around with those. It's not all or nothing. Um, some models, when the temperature is very low, they're actually deterministic. So the same prompt will give you the same response. It doesn't hold true for every model, but um, that's one way you can tweak them. Uh, another way is top K and top P that are both related to, it's still gonna be, he how heavily weighted it'll be around the top, um, or the most probable next tokens. And it's two different ways to slice the data, but you can also, you can have a little bit more uh, variance uh, in there without going, moving the temperature entirely. And you can play with all of these just like you would with an API, or if you were in Photoshop and you were uh, moving the gamma and the contrast, et cetera, in a, in a image that you're, you're gonna, you can use these as well. Cool. So this is the uh, code that we've been showing today and an example of how I put together the prompt and then an example which is truncated because I needed to make it sure we could get it on the slide of the response. So on the left hand side we've got the prompt. Now this prompt is written in a format which is uh, used with Anthropic and the Claude models which is a conversational chatbot or chat conversational model. So we actually start the prompt off with human colon. And then later on, further down, and we can't see it because we couldn't fit it on, we've got assistant colon. And that's at that point that we're actually asking the model to come back with the, with the generation. But the thing that I wanted to show you here, um, and the thing that's really useful for the architecture specifically that we put together, was you can see in the middle of that prompt, um, we've got a, um, a, a section where we specify some JSON output or specify a JSON template. So we say, um, and, and, and just in case there's anybody who hasn't tried this, we are working with text prompts. We're talking to an LLM in natural language. So these aren't comments. This is actually how we're getting the system to work. And so halfway down here it says, and here is how to provide the output in this JSON format. Include at least three items, so that's three pages of the story, um, in one story body. And so then we've got that. Now, just anybody watching, see the curly braces with the raw written in it? That's because we're using Ginger to do some templating, and obviously the uh, JSON structure would mess up that otherwise. So this is basically saying ignore templating for this part. Um, but it's giving that JSON structure of what we want with the title and the body and the image prompts inside there. And then on the right-hand side, again, it's truncated. Ooh. These are all great elephant jokes, by the way. Truncated output. Um, we've got the output showing us what it actually looks like. So we do have blue elephant in this particular example. Ellie goes to reinvent, and you can see the JSON structure that's been output. So we've been specific with Claude to say that we want a JSON output so that we can then programmatically work with that in the subsequent Parts. Yeah. And I think that's a, a very important distinction. Because we wanted to chain things together and we wanted to have this be part, an intermediate part in the program running, JSON was a good fit for our format. But we could have said anything, XML, uh, formatted as a table that I'm going to 
throw on a, on a website, whatever we wanted to do. In our case, it, it was just um, the middle step into something else. So we wanted to have JSON so we could go dot notation or whatever and pull out elements from it, from um, stub functions. Awesome. So I can give a bit of a demonstration of um, using Claude. Um, so if I can just press down here, and everything works for us. So I just thought um, I'll show you briefly using Claude, Claude v2, and we can look at some of the inference parameters or the, the, the parameters that we saw in the um, payload before, like temperature, for example. Um, and we're using it inside of Amazon Bedrock, which, of course, is what we're using in the back end for our project as well. Um, so Amazon Bedrock, if you've not seen it, and maybe just a quick recap. So it's a collection of foundation models, so um, text generation models, but also image generation models, um, which we can use inside of our application. Um, and it makes them accessible via an API endpoint, much in the same way as you might find with lots of different AWS services. Just real quick recap, if you've not used it before, going into the console page for the first time, just scroll down to the bottom and have a look at model access. Um, and this has been an extremely exciting page to look at over the next couple of, uh, last couple of days, as more models have been released. So you do have to come down in here and select the models you want to have access to. And in this particular account, that's all of them for me, because I'm super excited to use all of them. Um, so we can see that we've got models from different providers, like AI21 Labs. We've got our own as well, Amazon's own models, but that's not all. So we do have many models from different providers. So there's Anthropic models there with Claude and Claude Instant. We've got Cohere. We've got Meta with the Llama models in there, and that's just exploded recently. We've added more models into there. And we've also got Stability AI with Stable Diffusion, so SDL, SDXL. 0 0.8 is the version we're using for this. Uh, 1.0 launched um, very recently. So we uh, can fold that into the next version of this. So if I just scroll up here and go um, and look at the menu on the left-hand side, we've actually got playgrounds. And whilst this is uh, great for demonstrations like this, this really is the beginning of the developer journey for building in foundation models, large language models, into your application. The experimentation is required. You need to experiment with different models, the different models you have available, and you should also experiment with different prompting and prompting structures. And it's much easier to do that in a playground like this than it is to write your own code, deploy something, test it, no, okay, roll it back, do something else, do something else. So this text playground is, is not just about trying to demonstrate what these things are capable of. It's the beginning of the development journey. So if I just um, maybe collapse that down to make it a bit bigger for us, we can go ahead here and select a model. And I'm going to select, well, we'll select the one that we're using for this uh, particular demo, which is Claude V2. Um, and we've got all of the different um, uh, attributes to do with the models are available in here, of course, with all the documentation as well. Let's go ahead and use actual Claude V2, which is the one we were using, and click Apply. And so we end up in this um, text playground here. There is also a chat playground and an image playground. But this text is kind of like the, the rawest you can do. I think it's probably the most useful if you're right at the stage where you want to start building your first application. So we can type in a prompt into here. We can also change some of these configuration options over on the side. Um, and making generations with large language models live on stage in Vegas is an amazingly awesome experience. And you should really try it. Um, let's see what this does. OK, so we could say, um, and th there's some reason for this, but let's say write a summary. You're going to freak out here. Write a summary um, about Las Vegas. Um, and we're just going to put that in. Now, what's going to happen when I press Run is um, it's going to actually change the format. If you remember before when we were looking at the prompt template, we've got the human colon stuff and then assistant colon. And that's actually the format you need to prompt with Claude. Otherwise, it will return an error. And the, um, the console here, the, the playground, knows that. So when I press Run, it will reformat it for us in that way. And those two line breaks at the top, incidentally, are intentional as well. And so then it's coming down with its, um, with its generation. Now, it stopped there, um, and it stopped after um, the city's tolerance is for numerous, and maybe that was good that it stopped. But it stopped there, um, and you notice it's not generated any more text. So now's the time for us to go to the site. Stop reading the details. I don't know what it says. So we're going to have a look at the configuration on the side. So on the side here, we've got these things that we were looking at before in the, uh, in the payload that we were sending. So we've got temperature, top P, top K. We've also got maximum length. Those ones that I kind of want to focus in on. So temperature, as Memo was saying, is all about how creative you want it to be. I mentioned before about large language models having random number generators in them. This essentially is um, 
telling the large language model how much we want that randomness to actually influence the output. We can go into this in a lot more detail. I'm happy to stand on the side of the stage later if anyone wants to come and ask questions about the details of how this works. But really, just turning this down is going to make it more deterministic. Turning it up will make it less. When writing a story like we're doing here, we'll turn it all the way up and see what on earth can happen and have all kinds of fun things happen. If you're trying to do some, um, something where you're doing sentiment analysis, for example, and you want a single word output, you might want to turn this down. If you're generating code, because that's the application you're writing, you might want to turn down the creativity there too. And I can show it working kind of in a minute. Um, hopefully. Um, and we've also got maximum length. So you'll notice that we've sort of cut off um, halfway through the generation. Um, so that's because this maximum length is set to 300. I could set this much higher, um, and we could delete this and try again. And in that instance, it should probably go through to the end. It's not setting the number of tokens that we will generate. It's setting the maximum number of tokens we might generate. Because the tokens are mostly just words, but there are some really special ones in there as well. And they might, uh, the, the model may generate an end of sequence token, basically saying, I've done what I think you wanted to happen, so I won't go any further. So that's why it's maximum tokens, not absolute total tokens. Um, let's ramp that all the way down to something quite small. So, so that could be quite useful from, from a cost determination, determination perspective, because um, most large language models, and in Amazon Bedrock too, you pay for the inference based on tokens, tokens in, tokens out. There are provision throughputs as well, but the, basically it's tokens in, tokens out. So let's change this to write a one word summary about Las Vegas. And I've done this before. It's OK. The word's OK. Usually OK. Let's see what happens. Let's turn the temperature all the way up um, and press run. And hopefully, yeah, we get one word comeback, which is useful. Um, and it's entertaining. Fantastic. So let's go ahead and run that again. I'm just going to run that a few times. So it says entertaining. Oh, it says entertaining again. We're looking for it to say something a bit different. Um, it's still entertaining. And uh, hopefully the uh, live demos that we're putting on here are entertaining too. Let's make sure that that's there. We are rolling a dice. And so I guess in the grand scheme of things, it's coming back to the same thing. The idea here is, oh, there we go, fun. Yay. Let's go for something, one more. Is it going to say entertaining? Who thinks it's going to say entertaining when I press run again? We've got at least, yeah, we've got several hands. OK, let's see what we can do. I don't want to disappoint you, but at the same time, I do. Um, Hey, entertaining. OK, so the idea is it's making a random roll, um, and it's really trying to come up with something different. Um, I'm just going to tell you, and it, prob it will work. If I turn the temperature right down, it's likely to come up with the same thing every single time. I'm tempted not to press run to see if that's actually what happens. I mean, when you're, when you're demoing something which has actually got something random in the middle of it, what are you, what are you supposed to do? Um, so fun, that's good, that's fine. Let's run it one more time. Who thinks it's going to say fun? It should say fun. Positive people, thank you so much. All right, <laughs> let's press this. Yay! OK, so I'm not going to press it again because I'm not temp fate. But it, it's actually a bit tricky to test this temperature thing um, at this kind of scale. If you're generating much more text, then you do see some differences. And so I just wanted to put that in the demonstration. And hey, the demo was fun, right? Yeah, and I think it's important to highlight that what Bedrock allows you to do is to test all the models this quickly, right? You don't, Mike didn't have to do anything special. We didn't have to spin up any EC2s, didn't have to do any, anything like that. You can just think, what model do you want to test? You can type in, start doing your prompt engineering. And a lot of the work is that, like how do you write the prompt that is the ideal for what you want to get uh, as an output? And you, that's where like saying, okay, I want the output as an a JSON object, here's the format, et cetera, et cetera, using the right data in the context windows, it, uh, helps, but once you're fairly confident you found the right LLM and you have the right prompts, then you can start building. So you don't have to um, spin up a whole infrastructure, a whole app to do it. You can start playing around uh, with it today. Yeah. Um, and your, the, the pricing model is, uh, like Mike mentioned, per token. So each one, each one of them is a little bit different, just like different APIs. The, the values for temperature, for top for top E, et cetera, are going to be different for each one of the models. How the prompts need to be formatted, what's going to work better, et cetera, is going to be per model. So we do encourage you to play around with as many as you can. Uh, and uh, that's the whole point of Bedrock. In some cases, the models 
that are in bedrock is the easiest or the only way to gain access to them. So um, there's, there's a big advantage there as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk about generating images a little bit. And this is uh, in, in the same vein as what we talked about a little bit earlier. We're still using bedrock, but we're using a uh, foundation model from a different provider, um, which uh, is Stable Diffusion. And the, the model is called Stable Diffusion XL. Um, and you'll notice everyone has their own names and their naming conventions for, for, the, um, for the models. But there is a, an emerging trend around calling the models by the size that they are. And um, a good stat that I, uh, and we should have had that on the slide, I, know, I apologize, but the size of the models is probably one of the things that differentiates generative AI and these foundational models most, more than anything else. Uh, the size of the models has grown thousands of times um, from 2019 to 2022. Uh, I think it's 1600X going from like a, one of the largest models to, to the largest model that we've trained. Um, so we don't expect any of you to go out there and train your own model, but to take advantage of these. So uh, that's why we call them foundational models, because you build on top of them. Um, and it changes a little bit the, the, the workflow. Uh, and this one, and I went on that rant because it's the Excel model, because it's bigger. It's trained with more data, so it, it behaves in, in a better way. And this is something that changed from when we built this. And I went uh, and we did the editing with uh, the people at, at reInvent, and we locked in our deck. From when we did that to today, there's already been changes. So one of them is we were using stability, uh, Stable Diffusion Excel 0.8 uh, through Bedrock. Now you have access to 1.0, and it's it's uh, it, it's even better. So there's, it's a very fast-moving industry. And we also have access to Amazon's own image generation model now as well, which wasn't available to us when we put this together. So when we were working on this, we didn't have access to the Titan uh, image models. Now those are available as well, and um, you can play with all of them. One, one thing that uh, Stability AI and through their um, Stable Diffusion Excel model they have is both text to image and image to image, which means you can pass an image in and say, on this image or using this image as a data input, do X or Y. So you know it, it's working from an image. Or you can just start with a text image and go from there uh, and build something from scratch. And here you'll notice the parameters are a little bit different. Um, C CFG scale, seed, steps, and then use random seed. That seed is literally the random number generator or the random number seed that the model is going to use. So if you change that number around, um, it'll use every parameter, but just like and change it a little bit. Uh, and you can say, don't use a random seed or use a random seed as well. Cool. Uh, this is what the code actually looks like. So we have our image that, we're, uh, that we can pass in. And uh, we have a background, a few, uh, uh, some Biden coded data that we wanted to pass in and say, it's an award-winning, low detail, bold outline, high contrast, saturated colors, exaggerated features, because we wanted to get something cartoony. So we gave it all those, those positive values. And then there's a the concept of negative prompts. And those are what you don't want to see there. So we didn't want to have humans in our story. So we have man, woman, child, person, people, crowds. And then we didn't want it to be ugly. So nothing ugly, not safe for work, or realistic. And then it just. Uh, a, a little list of, of uh, values or things that we did not want, and that's what a uh, negative prompt is. And here's a few examples of what the model can generate. So oh. we have a tiger, we have a blue elephant. Um, <laughs> th those are all from, the, from it running on the show floor. Absolutely. Um, so let me just jump back into demo, and we can take a look at that happening here as well. So inside of the Amazon Bedrock console, um, well, I've selected a different playground. This is the image playground. And so in exactly the same way, we get to select a model. Um, and as Memo was saying there, we've got the different models available here. So we've got this uh, new Titan image generation model, so image generator G1. Um, we've got Stability AI here with both of those models we were talking about. So Stable Diffusion XL 0.8 uh, is the one we're using here. Let's jump in and have a look at 1.0. So I'm going to click Apply on that. And it's exactly the same kind of experience that you had before um, with some configuration options down the side. And we can type in a prompt. So again, we've had lots of debates about what we should type in here, but let's have a go. Um, a blue elephant in. Whoop. 
And yeah, we're just going to stay on brand with a blue yeah. elephant. Yeah, at yeah. this point, you, we, he's how, a, how, how, how bad can it be? A um, third so, presenter. <laughs> everybody's with their buttons press ready. Um, so generating the image. So that's going off to the, obviously, there you go. So because now, so what's happened there is, um, and like, that kind of looks fairly familiar if you've been walking up and down the strip. But all I asked for was a blue elephant in Las Vegas. So that's actually pretty good. Um, we didn't have all of those other prompts in there, negative and positive and otherwise, to turn it into a cartoon. So we, this, is, this is what we expected. So it took it literally, and I was like, it's a, it's a picture of a blue elephant in Las Vegas. That picture doesn't exist anywhere. It didn't take pictures and mash them up. It's completely generated from scratch. Uh, and the way that works is it's, uh, it, it adds noise. So the way those models are trained, they take a picture that does exist in the real from the real world, adds noise till it gets to a point where it's all noise, and at every step, it's like, can you return to the original picture? When it can actually do that, then we, we can generate images from noise and, and text. So it's not like it's pulling an image down and then slapping an elephant on it and changing the hue. It's generating the image. Um, uh, and it's, in principle, it's the same as with the text. It just goes, what is the next most probable token? Yeah. And have you seen Las Vegas? I mean, in principle, there has been a blue elephant in Las Vegas. <laughs> I'm we, sure it's happened. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it's happened. OK. Should we go back? Run for the clicker. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about orchestration and, and how all this stuff is happening, how all this stuff is being pulled together. So we get back a little bit more serious and a bit more of the code side of things. There's, there's a number of different ways that you can build applications, of course, um, tying into generative capabilities. And, and one way that you might have heard about is Langchain. Um, so Langchain, this, this kind of is, there's one of these companies that's got a logo which is made out of emojis. So you're sort of like um, beholden to whatever the font set is that you've got on the actual slide. So, um, for, so. Yeah, for those observant, if you Google Langchain, you'll see a green parrot and a different looking chain. Yeah, but hey, but it's a parrot and a chain. The Windows box doesn't like that. <laughs> so you get a red guacamaya or something. Um, so yeah. So what is Langchain, though? So Langchain is an open source project that's been going pretty much for most of this year. Um, it's one of the most active open source projects I've ever seen. So if you have a look on GitHub, the commits are through the roof. Um, it's, a, it's a prompt engineering platform. They don't necessarily describe it in that way, but I do. Um, they basically got a, uh, it's the open source project is sort of split into how to uh, communicate with things like large language models and other systems, and then a big part of it is just a whole bunch of pre-made prompt templates which sit in there. So if you want to, say, for example, connect a large language model with a SQL database, like I applied you could before, you can absolutely do that in Langchain. You can go and grab the SQL chain. There was an experimental chain. It's not a common thing that people do these days. Um, but you can basically create that instance of that object. You can point it in the direction of a large language model. And there is uh, Bedrock, Amazon Bedrock, have um, extensions for Langchain. So you can just tie it straight into there. And then you can point it at your data source, like, so for example, your SQL database or something other than that. And then you can start prompting with it. And you can basically send that object in your code. It's Python and JavaScript, by the way. But there's plans afoot to port it um, to other platforms. And I think um, something important there, it's, it's a framework, right? It's right. not a required technology. It, it's oh, yeah, yeah. A, a way that people like to work with these technologies. It's overlays on top of it. You can, it's very, very popular. It's very handy. Uh, I like it, but it, it's mm -hmm. not a requirement. But you, uh, with the industry moving so quickly, it almost appears like, oh, everything has to use Langchain. Absolutely. Not, not necessarily the case. Absolutely. And in fact, not in this case. We didn't use Langchain for this. I just wanted to highlight the, the elephant, the, highlight the, the obvious thing. Lots of people are using it. And it's definitely something you can do if you're looking to orchestrate your application together. Now, we didn't do that. What we did instead was use AWS step functions, um, as you may have seen or remembered from the diagram we saw before. And we used step functions to basically coordinate the different tasks we wanted. So if we wanted to go away and get some live data, we can do that, bring back the string, bring it into the step function context, um, state, sorry, and then pass that into other um, parts of the uh, uh, architecture, the other parts of the function. Um, 
AWS Step Functions, if you're not familiar with it, it's basically a state machine that you can use to tie together different services um, and Lambda functions. It's very, very extendable. So it can, you can basically build a serverless application using all service endpoints and Lambda functions. So you don't have to deploy your own infrastructure, and it'll maintain state for you, and you can break apart your application into different discrete components. And this is a screenshot um, of uh, the console after this has been deployed, and this is this actual project. Gives you an idea about what it looks like. On the left-hand side is the definition. It's a little bit difficult to in initially get into. There is a visual editor inside the console you can use as well, but if you're a bit old school like me, you do it this way. Um, so you put together this JSON structure, and you basically specify, I want to start off where you want to start off. I want to call a Lambda function, and then I want to call different parts. Now, one of the really um, interesting things, I think, about this architecture architecture is that you may recall that we get Claude v2 to output a JSON structure. And it's a very specific JSON structure. And what we do is we actually pass that actual structure, so the output of Claude v2, and we put that into the state machine, the step functions. And step functions reads it and splits up the jobs to do. So one of the things, um, if you remember back to our sample output, we had multiple different pages. Each page had text and an image prompt. And that was a set standard format. And you can actually have variable numbers of pages, but so far in experimentation, it's always three. But with that, where the step function splits apart the JSON structure and parallel processes that. Because one of the key things that this does is generate the images for us. So it sends the prompts off to, uh, stable, uh, to stable Diffusion running inside of Amazon Bedrock. And, and it actually happens. So you can see here, iterate over body, that part of the, um, the step function's code there. That is actually running in parallel. That will scale out to as many images as we have. So you can parallel process, and you can create as many images as you want on the fly. You notice that when we made Elephant in Las Vegas in the demo, it took, took a couple of seconds to do. So we don't want to have to wait for each one. And we just parallel process all of those. And then we bring it all back together, and we create one HTML story to be able to share with people on the show floor. I, I think the timing and the, the how long generation takes is something that as developers we all have to get used to. Because yeah. many of us are used to working with APIs or making, uh, using DynamoDB to get data, and it's very, very quick, um, milliseconds, uh, et cetera. And when we're generating things, it, they can take multiple seconds or, or longer. So how are you going to manage that from your application side? Uh, how are you signaling to the, to the customer, hey, I'm working on this. I'm actively working on this. The, the, the site hasn't crashed or the app hasn't crashed. Uh, all of those different things, there's, there's ways to, to, to do it in, in, in a proper way, but it, it does require some forethought, and it might be different from what you're doing today. Absolutely. And would come and talk to us at the end. We've definitely got strategies for that as well. So here, revisiting just for a moment the architecture that we had at the beginning, um, there is a subtle difference. Small change. So one of the changes that we were able to incorporate, because uh, it was just editing an architecture slide, was in the first step uh, where we had the step functions, and you see it forking into two uh, bedrock logos where it's saying story generation and image generation. In the middle, we had Lambda functions. So we had to write Lambda functions that step functions would trigger, and then those would call the bedrock service. As of yesterday, that is no longer necessary. You can call bedrock directly from step functions. And um, I don't know how many of you here are developers. There's nothing that most developers like more than deleting and throwing code away. So we no longer need to have Lambda functions that are acting just as glue in moving things around. We can call the service directly. That makes it easier for us because there's one less piece that we need to debug and maintain and grow. So uh, that was a, a great announcement during the uh, this week. So and like those, there's many, many more, and we could take this demo and, and add them. Uh, unfortunately, it's it's hard during the week because we're also doing a bunch of other stuff. But uh, we wanted to also call out the fact that there's a whole uh, slew of things coming along, and we're. The demo we've been iterating on it in, in multiple dimensions. I think the, the, the next one is a lot of what Mike did uh, on his own on the opposite end of the spectrum from the cloud. 
there you go, right, yes. So I basically, I have a lot of things to do on the plane on the way home is what you're saying. We're re refactoring code. That's fine. Yeah, so we had a lot of fun putting this together, and uh, hopefully it's been interesting for you to take a look at this as well. Yes, we um, iterated through all kinds of different designs. We had grand plans. We had lots of things made. We tried to simplify it, though, down so that we could actually have something if we had something that worked, yeah. I'm not sure we yeah. were successful there, but on the show floor, it works, people. It does. So we, we went from a, a very simple, uh, Mike made it over a weekend uh, with wood design, and then like Mike the said same. we had a very ambitious plan with CNC cut um, things that we, we were shipping, but then the, those weren't as structurally sound as they needed to be, so we, we went for a simplified design that was very robust. So how, that's how we ended up with what you see today. But it was, it was very fun to work on this, uh, to show something that was, that was relevant. I think something that we just skimmed right over was we're also grabbing headlines from reInvent, and that's why a lot of this stuff is, uh, that it generates on the show floor will say, oh, the giraffe was at AWS reInvent 2023, or the service, there'll be service names, stuff like that around it, because we wanted to merge uh, having those headlines and the image, and that's how we could work with live data. And those headlines could be coming from an API, it could come from a data stream, it could come from, from whatever you want, and uh, that's how, how you can combine it. So it doesn't have to be just static or typing or anything like that. It could be in, uh, more of an um, event-driven architecture mm. as well. Absolutely. So yeah, just you get your live data, you get your data, your live data, data that the model's never seen before. We put them into the context. It's as simple as that, but then we start, we call it retrieval augmented generation. There's lots of directions we can go off in that direction too. So yeah, one, one poll. last poll and um, in the theme of wanting to inspire you and uh, we want to hear from you as well. So what else would you want us to, um, what, what else do you want to explore so it can inform us and Mike and I can go uh, take our blue elephant demo and take it in that direction for next year? What do you want to explore next? <laughs> Not blue elephants. Not blue elephants. Okay, I'm gonna answer this as well, let's do it. I think you can, and I think we got some results. Yeah. So yeah, so using RAG, so retrieval augmented generation, fine tuning as well is there, but oh, live data, so this is coming in as we're watching, okay. Yeah, so there's, there's a couple there around fine tuning. Getting started, I think, um, Mike, can you throw on Party Rock on there for, for Absolutely. us? Absolutely. So yeah, if have you've not seen this, you need to see this. A new product that we announced recently that's called Party Rock that also can help you get started uh, on your um, journey with generative AI. Uh, it's very, very friendly. Uh, I, that's, that's the site, partyrock.aws. No uh, coding necessary. And what you can do is you can build um, small experiences that uh, will help you play around with prompt engineering. So this one, um, and there's uh, a way to share those with your friends or with the internet in general. So we, I think Mike just grabbed a, a random one from there. It's a podcast generator. And you type in what the topic of the podcast is, um, and it'll, it's going to generate. This wasn't, this wasn't planned, so uh, it's going to generate the You're podcast. That, like all, any of this was planned. So podcast <laughs> description. Yeah, we just got up there. We really don't know who was going to deliver this talk. We stole, we stole, <laughs> stole their demo. Um, it's generating the podcast name, the podcast description, and then uh, it's going to generate a backstory, hosts, images, names. So you can put, you can, you can fit, add just some data there, and it's going to generate this. But if you wanted to build your own, whatever it was, right? Like make me cover albums for my music band, or uh, help me uh, write titles for my for my blog. You can you can do that today. Just drag and drop. You can, uh, if you go into the settings of each one of those little boxes, you can choose what LLM you want to work with. Uh, you can type the prompt. You can, you can do all the prompt engineering from there. No uh, AWS account required, so you can play with it today. Anyone can do it. Um, it's really just so you can start exploring and getting familiar with, with all the LLMs doing uh, prompt engineering. And once you're ready to take the next step forward, there's Bedrock, there's SageMaker, there's, there's a bunch of other services as well. Um, we're almost out of time, uh, but the most important thing I wanted to say is thank you. It's Thursday. You were here with us all, all uh, really late. I think we're the last thing between most of you in a beer or a nap. So I really, really appreciate the time. 
Um, we don't take this for granted. Mike and I were saying it is so, so humbling seeing so many people here uh, to listen to us, to, to us talk. So I, I really, really wanted to say thank you uh, for that. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Any questions? Come and talk to us in a minute.